Hey guys, your boy Chill here. Welcome back to Shallow Dive. In this video, we are going to embark on a new journey to draw a single triangle on the screen. Yes, the hallowed object of all graphics programmers, the Rainbow Dorito. Let's get started. Now, when I say triangle, you say vertex. And when you say vertex, I say direct X math for our vectors. While we're here, let's include ranges because I love them so. And let's put in a few shortcuts. Importing and aliasing namespaces. Always good in your CPP file, never in your H file. I will punch you in the face. Okay, now where are we gonna put our stuff? Right here. After we've done all our initialization previously, we do more initialization. Yay! Let's define our structure for our vertex. Nothing interesting here, just your standard position and color. Next thing, we must create a vertex buffer on the GPU side to store the geometry data. Now, buffers, textures, everything is just a resource in Direct3D12. Uh, we're also gonna keep track of how many vertices we got in that bad boy to make our life a little easier. Okay, first step, make a little array of data on the CPU side to hold our triangle, three vertices. Let's calculate and remember the number of vertices in that are gonna be in our buffer. And now let's actually create the dang resource. Okay, so this is quite a mouthful, um, but let's break it down. Uh, so the function we're calling here is create committed resource. Now, the first question is, okay, so what is what is committed mean? What, like, how does that differ from a non-committed resource? Is it like engaged to be married? What, they, you know, you got a baby on the way? I don't know, how. what level of commitment are we talking about here? So here's the thing about Direct3D12, it's kind of annoying. Uh, when you want to create resources, you can't just, you, normally you don't just create your resources. First, you create a heap on the GPU, which is just a big chunk of memory. And once you have that chunk of memory, then you can choose where to place all of your resources in there. And that gives you a lot of flexibility, but it's also more annoying. But it lets you do things like, for example, allocate two resources that are actually overlapping each other in memory. And as long as you're not using them both at the same time, that can work. And that can save you more space than if they were, you know, each occupying unique addresses in the GPU. So that's very cool and very legal, but it's also annoying. Here's the thing. Committed resource, special case. When you create a committed resource, uh, you say, um, give me a resource of this size, and Direct3D will create a heap of the same size for you for that resource, and it will tie it to the resource. So when you destroy the resource, it'll automatically destroy the heap for you. You don't even see the heap. It's called an implicit heap because it's all managed for you behind the scenes by Direct3D. And of course, you have to create, it'll create then one heap per resource that you're creating, which is less efficient in many ways, but uh, it's also easier, which is very good for us right now. Long story short, when you call create committed resource, it's gonna create a heap and a resource at the same time for you, and it's gonna manage the heap for you behind the scenes. Cool. Okay, so we need two things. We need something to describe the heap, and we need something to describe the resource that is created in that heap. Uh, now, there are structures in D3D for these things, so if we look at like the function call it, and D3D12 heap properties, D3D12 resource desk, these are the structures that you fill and uh, that tell this function how to operate. D3DX12 gives us some nice helpers to make our life easier, and that is why we use them. So let's take a look at these, go to definition. I'm not going to dive too deep because this is a shallow dive, but you see here D3DX property inherits from the structure in the API. So it inherits from the straight C structure and it adds some C++ stuff to it to make your life a little easier uh, to set some defaults. So you don't have to set them. It just makes your code cleaner. It makes your life easier. You're not a coding monkey. You are an advanced programmer. You are, this kind of stuff is below you. Setting these defaults, that's below you. But if we look here, this is what you would have to interact with. You have to set this, 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 and this for the heap properties. Um, now what that function that we're calling the, uh, the constructor here does is it just takes in the, the type of the heap and it'll set all that other stuff up for you. Very nice. Uh, and the same story for resource desk. It's a very common pattern. The D3DX one inherits from the one in the API. And this one actually adds some static functions to set things up for you. 
So like I said, resource could be a texture, it could be a buffer, it could be different kinds of textures. Uh, when you want to set it as a buffer, it's very simple. A lot of those um, parameters are all just fixed. So calling this function, it's actually this one here, it has some parameters that have defaults. The only one you have to pass in, the only one that is uh, mandatory is the width. So we're calling this function, instead of having to set, let me just go to it here, go to definition. Instead of having to set all this stuff, some of these are also structures that have nested types in it that you have to set. We can now create the buffer, just passing in one thing, the size of uh, vertex data. All right, very clean, very nice. So we create these two things, D through DX doing good work for us. We pass them into the create resource function. Note that the heap type is default. This is the efficient type for use by the pipeline. So you want to create, you know, a lot of your resources that you are creating, you want to create them on the default if possible. And note that we have a resource state here that we're passing in. This tells it what is the, what the state the resource will be in after we create it and is going to be in the copy destination state, which makes sense because after we create this thing, we've got to copy this data in. Note that this function doesn't take a pointer to this data because you got to copy that in manually. And the rest of the parameters, they're, you know, just what is, what is this null pointer? Optimized clear value, that only makes sense if you're creating a texture that you're going to render to. And then the thing that you're going to fill, the vertex buffer. Okay, cool story, bro. Now, we make the thing. We want to copy the data from here into here now. That's why we made it as a copy desk. Problem number one, heap type default not accessible by the CPU. So we can't copy this data from the CPU into here directly. That's not going to work. What we need is to copy this data into a different resource and then have the GPU copy from that resource into our vertex buffer. So we need another resource. And I'm calling this one the vertex upload buffer. So we create committed resource for CPU upload of vertex data. And you can see here it's very similar to this one. Um, but the heap type is upload and the resource state is generic read because we were going to want to cut the GPU is going to have to copy from this one to this one. So now the CPU can copy into this one because it is a type upload and then the GPU copies from this one into this one. Cool story, bro. So let's copy our array of data into the upload buffer. This operation is performed by the CPU. So we're going to get a pointer to the place where we can copy this data. We get that pointer by calling a little function called map. So vertex upload buffer, we are going to map the memory. Now this one is actually, it's, I think it's actually a little simpler than Direct3D11, if you'll believe that. Direct3D11 maybe handles some stuff behind the scenes, um, some synchronization for you when you're mapping and unmapping, and that's not handled anymore. You've got to handle that yourself. So now it actually becomes simpler in a sense. But anyways, so you call map, and what that's going to do is it's going to map, because the what you're doing is you're writing into memory on the GPU, which is connected via the PCIe bus. So now you've got to map addresses in the CPU memory space, in the virtual memory space of your process, map them to the PCI bus hardware that's going to allow you to transfer data over to the GPU memory. That's what this is doing. So it's mapping addresses into your memory space that in hardware sense, map to the PCIe bus. This map function gives you a, a typeless pointer, it's a void pointer. It fills, a, it fills a void pointer, but we're going to give it a typed pointer because we know that that memory is going to contain vertex data. And once we have that type information, beauty of beauties, we can use ranges copy to copy from the vertex data into map vertex data without having to calculate lengths or offsets or anything and screwing ourselves up and writing to bad memory. Range copy is going to do us a good solid. And then after we're done, it's just decent practice to unmap the memory. Uh, now, again, this is a shallow dive. I'm not going to go into depth, but you could specify a range in here. That range is the range that you are saying I might want to read from. I think no pointer just says it's the whole range, but I guess if you wanted to min-max things, you could specify that you don't want to read from anything by putting the begin before the end of the range. But we're not going to worry about that right now. It doesn't matter. Who cares? Nobody cares. I don't care. Do you care? You shouldn't. Okay, so now we have this data in here, but we want to get it into here. The only thing that can access this is GPU. So we got to tell the GPU, copy from here into here. How do we tell the GPU to do stuff? Well, we uh, we put commands in a command list and we submit those bad boys to a queue. So, let us reset our command list and our allocator, get them ready. 
And then we say, yo, dog, copy the from here into here, please. Thank you. And I mean, that's all we need. So we close the command list and then we submit that to the command queue. And there you go. It'll be off and the command queue will start copy the GPU will pull that off the queue and it'll start copying the data from one buffer to another. And then when we exit this scope, this is going to be ref counted. It's going to be destroyed. The intermediate um, temporary buffer here will go away. And all we'll be left with is our vertex buffer, which is what we want. Amazing. Beautiful. Let's build it. Now let's run this bad boy. Oh, he was a bad boy indeed. Because we have an unhandled exception. Uh, apparently when trying to release something. Client.h. Okay. Not sure what that is. Ah, com pointer. Com pointer to what? Hmm. Com pointer to resource. Okay. Um, oh, we got some messages here from our debug layer. Corruption. Doesn't sound great. D3D resource object is referenced by GPU operations in flight in a command queue. Ah, yeah. So we did a little, we did a little bad thing. We did a bad thing. We did a bad, bad thing. So I said, hey, copy from our upload buffer into our vertex buffer. And I submitted that command. And then immediately I said, okay, now destroy this thing. But the GPU was like, hey, wait, I'm not, I'm not done yet. I'm still freaking trying to copy this shit. What are you doing? So maybe we should wait before it's done copying before we destroy the upload buffer. What do you think? You think that's a good idea? I think that might be a good idea. And so we do our standard thing, right? We, uh, we set signal value on the fence, increment it for the next time we signal, and then we set an event for the value that we just signaled. We wait for that. Okay, this should work, right? This, there's no way that this is going to blow up. Oops, it blew up. Okay, well... Exact same error. This one could be tricky. You might scratch your head. This one might be a little bit of a head scratcher. Because you're saying, wait a minute. I signaled a value on the fence. I'm waiting for it. I should be fine to destroy this thing. Why is it getting all angry up in my face? So a little oopsie doopsie here. When we create this fence, we create it with an initial value of zero. So zero is already signaled on there. And our local variable to keep track of the next value to signal is zero. Hmm. So then we set zero, we increment this, and then we wait for zero. But zero was there from the beginning. So when we wait for single object, this just doesn't block at all. It immediately exits and we destroy. So that's bad. That's pretty bad. I would say that's not optimal. We should probably set a new value that's not on there already. So we could do a pre-increment. And that has the nice side effect of now we don't need to do this fix up here because the value that is set is the current value. Nice. Okay. So now this fence value, this doesn't uh, represent the next value to signal. This represents the current signaled value, the current the value that you have um, signaled onto the queue. It might not actually be that value yet on the fence, but that's the one that's the most recent one that you had inserted into the queue. Okay. So this should fix it. And I mean, if we're going to do it like that here, we should probably, you know, be consistent. So here we want to do a plus plus, get rid of that bad boy there. And we'll do a plus plus here and run the mofo. And here we go. We are working. We don't have our triangle. Of course not. We didn't draw it. We just loaded the vertex data. But we, what we don't have either is any red text in our logging here. We don't have any exceptions. So I consider that a win. And if we exit, again, no more red text. So, so although we have no real way of verifying, we should now have this vertex buffer filled with this data by the end of this block here. One last thing before I end this video, I'm going to keep this videos as short as possible here. So we're not going to do the whole thing in one run. But one last thing, because it kind of goes together here. We've created the resource. We have to create the view of the resource. So we create our vertex buffer view, and it's just a structure fairly simple. You say where the buffer is located in GPU memory by calling vertex buffer get GPU virtual address. The size in bytes, which is just the number of vertices times the size of a vertex, and the stride, which is the distance between vertices. It's interesting to note here, like, in my mind, Direct3D12 is a little all over the place here with respect to these views. So sometimes they're referred to as views, sometimes they're referred to as descriptors. And for some of them, it's just simply a structure on the CPU side. But in other ones, you've got to like create a heap. Like for example, 
here you have to create a ID3D12 descriptor heap for your render target views. And then on the CPU side, you create handles to point to the different descriptors in that heap. So this, I assume this is making something on the GPU side, but this one down here, this is purely a creature that lives on the CPU side. So, you know, some of them are on the CPU, some of them are on the GPU. Sometimes we call them descriptors. Sometimes we call them views. You might not like it. I don't like it either, but that's the world that we're living in and we're just going to have to live with it. But anyways, so that's up. We've done all the Divertex stuff. In the next video, we are going to set up the rest of the stuff needed to render and maybe we'll do the rendering as well. So there's plenty plenty to go. The next video is going to have some really big stuff that's completely different from Direct3D 11. So prepare to have your mind expanded. I'm going to stretch your mind whole just a little bit there. Um, so look forward to that. But until then, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please click the like button. It helps a lot. And I will see you again with some more shallow dive.